And so we really then handhold the client through the application process to maximize their chances for a successful application. And then ultimately get them that, that passport at the end or say residency permit, which can either stay as a residence permit or eventually lead to a, a citizenship. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. It's Rick Nusky here. I hope you're doing wonderfully well. It is always great to be here as your host. And uh, you know what? It's absolutely so fantastic that I have the opportunity to be your host. Now on today's show, I'm excited to welcome Latitude's North American Managing Partner, Mr. John Green. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you so much for having me on the show today, Rick. Absolute pleasure to have you here. Now, uh, prior to the call, you and I talked about uh, our topics for the day, and we'll be discussing how business owners can leverage global citizenship to unlock new markets, future-proof their businesses, protect their wealth, and minimize geopolitical risks through global mobility. But also, John, we'll be covering uh, strategies to optimize taxes and expand investment portfolios. So to say that there's a fair bit to unpack here would be an understatement. Certainly, it's a uh, it's a growing market, but uh, a bit of an unknown market. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to delving into it with you. Absolutely. Again, thank you very much for joining me. And now, where are you calling in from, John? I'm actually in Vancouver, Canada. So I uh, one of the co-founders of Latitude, and I help oversee the North American operations for the company. I, you know, more or less stumbled into this business, citizenship and residency uh, by investment planning, and so. I come from a, originally a real estate marketing and sales background. I used to work for a, a company here in Vancouver that really helped to pioneer the art of the pre-sale when it comes to project real estate. So selling out a building in a in a, a whole day, you know, back in the early two thousands before it was even heard of that the kind of the the art of the pre-sale, so to speak. Um, and then a, a former colleague uh, started selling international real estate and stumbled across a small Caribbean island called St. Kitts and Nevis, where you could purchase real estate and qualify for citizenship. And it took me by surprise. I'd never heard of that. It was, this was back in about 2008. Mm -hmm. And so he convinced me to, to join him. And we started our journey in the, in the citizenship by investment space, uh, just over 15 years ago. Yeah, wow. Time flies, doesn't it? So, yeah. Um in your general location, how, how much of, uh, I guess, the the globe does that cover? Yeah, it's so we offer programs pretty much around the world, um, everywhere from here in North America with the, uh, in Canada, we offer the startup uh, visa in the US, the EB-5 program. We offer five Caribbean citizenship by investment programs. And then of course we offer programs in Europe as well. So both the golden visas and uh, the citizenship by investment program offered by Malta, which is Europe's only yep. citizenship program. And uh, a few other uh, uh, countries we, we get involved with from time to time as well. Now we've done a fair bit of research and before we jump into that, I also know that uh, you have some hobbies and some sports, but uh, before we jump into the call, the call uh, tell me about your golfing and your hockey. I know that you also enjoy a bit of skiing along the way too. Well, that's right. I, I'm Canadian, right? So I, I have to play hockey. I think it's in our blood, our, our DNA, so to speak. Yes, so I, I grew up playing the sport as well as skiing uh, on the local mountains and up at Whistler Blackcomb, uh, which is, you know, got spoiled with that and uh, c continue to, to play hockey to this day, what we call a beer league, uh, which is just an adult recreation league, but it's a lot of fun. It's great exercise. It's good camaraderie with, uh, with your teammates. And in the summers, I, I get to hit the the golf the golf course, but not quite as much time <laughs> as I used to uh, before kids. Kids kind of uh, slow you down a little bit with golf because you don't always have that five or six hours to to dedicate to a golf game on a Saturday. It's kids' sports now have uh, overtaken my life. Oh, I love it. Your spare time is their time. Hundred <laughs> percent. That's exactly. That's a great way to put it. I love it. <laughs> now I tell you what. When it comes to golf, if you want a core. Yeah, your golf course or your, or your lawn, come see me. I'm happy to help with all of that. But uh, I know that there's some great, uh, you know, uh, nightlife and food in, in your location. Tell me a little bit about that. Do you, you have much time to enjoy, um, you know, a, a meal now and then? I, I do. It's um, Vancouver is really a, a, a smorgasbord or a melting pot of cultures. So a lot of people from all over the world come here. So you have a lot of different food influences. Certainly sushi is one of our, uh, I think one of the dishes or cuisines that does uh, that you have so much options, so many different choices. 
uh, and it's fantastic here. It's fresh. Uh, of course, we're a, a, a city uh, on the ocean edge, and so we get a lot of variety. And uh, I'd say sushi is probably my favorite and go-to uh, go-to meal. Oh yeah, I'm hungry already. Now, as a managing partner, I know that you'd be uh, fairly busy most of the time. But you know, do you do you make time for yourself? And how important is uh, having some free time to you? Well, it's extremely important having that uh, work-life balance, right? Mm. So I love my job. Um, I'm passionate about it because we're helping clients achieve an important objective and goal in their life and through diversification of their of their citizenship or residency. But at the same time, I have my family life. So um, it, it's important to have that work-life balance. And while I always have my phone on me, I, I definitely put it on silent for for when I'm with my kids and when I'm you know helping to coach my son's hockey team uh, or baseball team. And uh, my daughter is just going to be starting sports soon. She's uh, just three years old, so she's a little maybe another year away. Uh, but I can only <laughs> imagine how busy I'll be then. And really, uh, you know, I'm lucky I can rely on my parents, the the grandparents, to to help out as well from time to time. Um, and, you know, I do travel quite a bit for work. It, it mm -hmm. just comes with the territory. We need to sometimes go to meet our clients, go meet uh, introducers, uh, different spheres of influence uh, for people that we're looking to assist. And so it, it gets me traveling all over the world quite a bit. And that's why it's it's great to have uh, some home support as well from both my wife and, and my parents. Fantastic. Thank you for the feedback. Now, I know that being uh, so busy, you know, having some sort of a regular routine of a morning um, could be challenging, but do you have some sort of a routine that you go through? Certainly, my my routine generally starts. You know, I'm I'm up at least by no later than six a.m. Um, and I I get right into to work after a quick meal uh, because I deal with our international offices a lot. So yeah. our London office, you know, our Malta office, sometimes even our Hong Kong office, and so I'm juggling all these different time zones. So my busiest time. Uh, work-wise is in the morning generally um, dealing with the other offices and then things start to slow down but then i have i'm dealing more with clients in the late morning early afternoon um so those are generally my days are, are early morning starts <laughs> love it with all of that you know you've talked about moving your body and you getting involved with all, all of your sports but does that make does that play a part in your daily routine for for example i get up of a morning i'm always doing a bit of exercise do you have any time to fit anything like that in I do. That's more evenings for me, right? right. That's when uh, uh, I, I get my exercise. My my hockey is usually late at night. Yep. Uh, that's, that's our ice times, and because uh, typically after work, I'm busy with the kids for for quite a few hours there, uh, getting dinner ready and everything. But exercise is a huge, hugely important and helps you know helps to de stress from the day and and uh, whatever you're running or you know uh, lifting lifting weights in the gym. It, it helps you to kind of reset the body and the mind and you can work through things as you're exercising you get that heart rate pumping um and it gets the you know um endorphins uh, stimulated <laughs> yep and so i think it's just hugely important to to get that into a daily routine um because we can get stuck behind our desk and and not move for hours on time so if you know if you got your your watch that's tracking your steps and everything and alerting you to just to move around a little bit even when you're on a phone call just walk around on that phone call uh it helps me to stay focused and and keeps the body moving but i think for me when you are having those bad days it's and sometimes it is tough to motivate yourself to to get uh, that exercise in but it, it's vital for me and and my mental health so I used to burn the candle at both ends, John, and, you know, I mm. wouldn't give too much regard to sleep. What would you say to, I guess, young entrepreneurs out there, uh, business owners who are doing that right now? Do you think that's a healthy move or what's your approach to this? Uh, it's not it's not healthy. I mean, you need to eat. You need to eat well. Mm. Right. And 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 not just one meal at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day. I think you need <laughs> to have that balance. Yeah. And you need to get that exercise. And, and sleep is your chance for your body to recover right from the day and re-energize yourself so if, if you work if you're sleeping you know very few people can get away on a regular basis with three four hours of sleep a night it's going to catch up to you you're going to crash out and burn most of us are required that you know six seven hours of sleep per night and you really do need that to to help reset the body and and set yourself up the next day for to be to be successful once again
So just for the sake of context, John, I'm wondering if you could share, I guess, your education and your professional uh, background and experiences. Certainly. So I, uh, I went to uh, University of Victoria over on Vancouver Island. So mm -hmm. it was far enough away from to get away from my parents, but just a ferry <laughs> ride away that I could come home for a, a home cooked meal. Oh, so beautiful. I was, you know, when I went to school, I, I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, really undecided. I ended up getting a, a Bachelor of Arts, but it did help, you know, teach me to be focused on a task and, and accomplish you know, um, the end goal, which w was a good grade. You know, I, I, I think I struggled more in high school as I didn't appreciate and have as much focus. But once I got to university, I realized it was all on me. And so that helped set me up. Um, and then I really got into sales and marketing of real estate, uh, you know, as an entry level job, as I said, and, and kind of worked my way up in the um, in that space, the marketing and sales of project real estate. And so that um, is really where I fell into it. And I, I'm pretty strong, I would say, with my interpersonal or, or people skills and emotional intelligence. And so that helped a lot when I started on the marketing side uh, of real estate and then switching over to the sales side, which was encouraged at the time by a few of the mentors that I, that I had uh, within the industry. And that you know really helped spur me into this industry that I'm in the citizenship and residency planning, mm. um, which, you know, is, is a is still a sales role. Of course, you're, you're helping to secure clients. Um, but it doesn't feel as, as much of a sales role anymore because it really feels like we're helping a client with a core need that they have. Um, Absolutely. you know, and so it's a very rewarding, uh, job. Well, you've done certainly well for yourself as a managing partner. Tell us a little bit about what that entails. What does exactly a managing partner do at Latitude? Certainly. So I'm on. I'm one of the co-founders of the company. We mm -hmm. uh, started it in about 2000, beginning of 2018, and uh, been on the the board of directors as well. And so I help to oversee our North American operations. So right. there's four of us in total that are kind of spread across the globe. And my job is to make sure that our, our Canadian and, and U.S. team are doing well on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we have everything from frontline people helping on the sales side to back office uh, team members, making sure that you know they're building our clients' applications along the way. And so making sure that that's all a smooth process and maximizing the, the experience for our clients, because that's what we really strive for is, is the customer experience. Uh, because you know the the best the the, the least expensive um, uh, way to generate a new client is through referrals, right? And so it just goes a long way when you have a current client who's extremely happy with your services and and doesn't hesitate to e you know to recommend a, a friend or family member of theirs. It's uh, the ultimate in relationship marketing, isn't it? Now, tell me a little bit. I mean, we've done our research. We've looked at all of Latitude services, but. Break it down for us because there'll be people on the call very excited to, to have you here and listening in. Um, how do Latitude actually help their clients and what services Certainly. do they have? So there's a few sides to our business. Um, the, main, the main side of our business is helping individual clients and their families obtain a second citizenship or a residence permit through investment-based programs. Um, so we'll help a client, we'll sit down with them, listen to what their goals and objectives are and what they're trying to accomplish. And then we can help find the right program to match those objectives and goals. And so we really then handhold the client through the application process to maximize their chances for a successful application. And then ultimately get them that, that passport at the end or say residency permit, which can either stay as a residence permit or eventually lead to a, a citizenship. The other sides to our business is not just the investment, but we also help clients with citizenship by descent. So those lucky enough to have the lineage, such as a, a parent or a grandparent, sometimes either even further back uh, from certain countries, you can apply for citizenship uh, through those relatives. And so it's generally a, a more cost effective way to obtain a second citizenship. So we call that citizenship by descent. And we have a division uh, that I help oversee uh, for that as well. And then the third part of our, our business is government advisory. 
So we have a very uh, experienced team that will go in and either help a country fine tune an existing um, investment migration program or we'll help them from scratch. So everything from passing the necessary legislation, designing the application forms and due diligence processes and hiring the staff to run the program. So that you know gives us a very unique insight into the industry as very few uh, companies are capable of, of creating these uh, complex programs. It's an interesting um, model. I'm wondering, where, what was the genesis? How did this uh, this business concept actually even come about? It's very interesting. The investment migration has a fairly short history. Mm. Um, when it comes to citizenship by investment, so this is when you are either contributing a donation to the government or an investment in real estate, and you can qualify for citizenship subject to due diligence checks. So the very first country to offer that was St. Kitts and Nevis in 1984. It was a very um, unknown program back then and really didn't start to take off until about 2008. Um, other type of programs have been around since really the early 90s or late 80s, such as the US EB-5. Canada had their old federal immigrant investor program. These are what's known as residence by investment programs where you're investing in the country. Uh, Canada at the time was in government, uh, essentially a government bond. And the US is in a, you know, you're investing into a regional center, which is creating jobs for Americans. And in return, you get a residence permit or that right to live in the country. Right. And so these type of residence by investment programs are much more common. And really Canada and the US were at the forefront of that um, in the early 90s. And then we've seen the, the industry evolve over the years. So Dominica, uh, another Caribbean country, in about 1993 came out with their citizenship program. And then a few more countries uh, in the Caribbean, such as Antigua, St. Lucia, and Grenada came out in around 2013 to 2016 with their citizenship programs. Um, then you will recall the, the federal debt crisis of 2008-2009. Oh, yeah. It really, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the, the southern European countries along the Mediterranean, Portugal, Spain and Greece, even Malta, were struggling with debt levels um, and really was, you know, especially Greece was close to bankruptcy. Mm. And so they, as a way to stimulate their economy, launched these golden visa programs where you invest into real estate in the return for a residence permit, which gives you the right to live in that country. And so they were hugely successful. Uh, most of them launched around 2012 and they did their job. They brought in billions in foreign direct investment, which helped to stimulate the economies. And you look at a country like Portugal, you know, you would have a developer purchase a, a half a block and redevelop it through golden visa applicants investing in, in the, the real estate. They'd buy an apartment you know, um, out of the whole building they were constructing. And then someone else would buy the other half of the block. And you would really see the change, the transformation of that little neighborhood. Um, and it just had a knock on effect. And so former whole city blocks that were dilapidated got re rebuilt. Revamped. And, um, and it really had a positive effect into these countries and, and helped bring them out of that debt crisis. Yeah. So are you seeing this uh, expansion continue globally with these it programs? Had, it did continue for a number for a number of years. Where we've seen a bit of a downturn, I'd say, in the programs. We don't quite have as many. A few programs have closed. Uh, mm. Ireland had their immigrant investor program. The UK had theirs. It was called the tier two, tier uh, the tier two, tier one program, but they've closed their programs um, because they pay, sometimes become too successful. Right. And um, and so they close them. Spain is considering closing their program right now. Right. Um, Greece and Portugal amended their programs to help appease the local populations who felt that, you know, maybe they're a little bit too popular as too many people were coming into the country and affecting real estate prices, for example. But um, but overall, uh, you know, the, the, the industry is still going very strong and, it, and it's growing by leaps and bounds because it is becoming more mainstream, I'd say in the world we live in, how globally we are connected, oh, yeah. you know, people don't wanna be just restrained by, by one country. 
you know, just because you were born in the U.S. doesn't mean you should you shouldn't have that opportunity to go work somewhere else in the world. And that's really where a lot of these programs come as they start to provide more flexibility and more options for both the individual and their family members. And this is what it's uh, it's 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 all about. Of course, many people, you know, when you're doing your financial planning, they've heard about uh, asset uh, diversification, you know, um, insurance real estate portfolio, portfolio, but what's becoming more important, still niche, is the citizenship and residency planning. And so not being kind of, you know, stuck with one country, but having more options in life. Yeah, that's very interesting because, you know, it's one thing to be, uh, you know, an entrepreneur or business owner, but, you know, knowing how to diversify those, those, I guess, those portfolios would be an interesting thing when we start to consider the benefits of going offshore with certain elements of your business and investing in real estate, all the things you've, t- you've touched on. Is there, a, is there a particular sort of location, a hotspot location at the moment in the world? Certainly. Well, you know, it, it, it all depends on our, our clients and their particular situation and, of course, their budget right. um, and what their goals are in, in time frames. So some clients are wanting immediate, immediate solutions and others are more comfortable with the longer journey. And I'll just give you two examples. Um, we have the, the Portugal Golden Visa, which is a, a venture, uh, an investment into a venture capital from fund from 500,000 euros, Mm -hmm. but currently the government is is a bit backlogged. They're taking about two to three years to process applications. Um, So some clients don't mind because, you know, they're not in a hurry. They maybe don't want to leave their home country, but they know they're starting the the process and they're setting themselves up later on in life. Um, But for some clients who may be more in a hurry, they might want to consider the Malta Citizenship by Investment Program where you know you're you're making a significant contribution to the government of malta and subject to stringent and i do stress that stringent due diligence checks you're granted citizenship in about 18 months and so that's a a hugely popular program um, for maybe our higher net worth clients uh, who can afford the price tag because it does come in around a million euros Mm -hmm. so it's not for everybody but it is that ultimate solution because it is it's a fairly quick really the fastest path to citizenship in the EU in about 18 months. And then, of course, once they're a citizen of Malta, should they ever, you know, them or their kids ever want to go live in another EU country, they have that right as an EU citizen. There certainly seems to be a lot more opportunities to help developing countries as well um, to open up new markets. What are the popular ones? Certainly. So, you know, we see in the Caribbean, uh, we have five citizenship by investment programs. As I mentioned earlier, St. Kitts and Nevis was really the world's first. But these programs um, and the other ones, as I previously mentioned, Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts, uh, St. Lucia and Antigua, these programs that they developed in the last 10 years or so have become hugely important for their economic prosperity. So they do represent a large portion of their GDP as they, you know, they're bringing in a significant amount of foreign direct investment into the country. And they generally have two components. I think, as I mentioned, either a contribution to the government, which starts at just over 200,000 US or an investment in real estate, which generally, you know, is gonna be 300,000 plus. And so that can bring significant amounts of money into the country, which then the government can use for important things like healthcare or road infrastructure. Um, you know, education. And so it gives the government a lot of flexibility and um, it's an important a part of those those five countries in the Caribbean's uh, economic prosperity. So when a business owner comes to you and they want to, you know, do all of the things that Latitude is offering, um, I guess, how do you identify what's best for them and how how is it that you go around reducing, I guess, the risk profile uh, for that client? Well, it's a great question. So a lot of it is listening uh, for us and, and finding out what the client's goals and objectives are at the end of the day. What are they trying to accomplish uh, and in what time frame? And of course, what's their budget, what they're comfortable with? Are they interested in a, providing a contribution to the government that's non-recoverable or are they more comfortable with a real estate investment? And so that all that information that we gain from them can help steer the right product or, or program to them because we'll present them. We're agnostic with what program the client chooses. We want to find what the best fit is for them. 
And this is one of my favorite examples I, I give is when um, we had, I had a prospective client asking us about the Malta citizenship program, which is, you know, uh, quite expensive at about a million euros for him and his wife. And I looked at their last name and I recognized it as being Italian. So I asked them if they had ever looked into citizenship by descent and they said they had, but they didn't, they didn't think they qualified. And so I asked them, well, let, let my team have a look first before we, we go further with Malta, let my team have a look. And it turned out both the, the husband and the wife both qualified for citizenship by descent in Italy. Oh, wow. So we ended up saving them about a million euros uh, <laughs> by going through their lineage as opposed to going through the economic route of a, a, a citizenship by investment program. So needless to say, they were ecstatic. Um, but that's the kind of thing that that brightens my day and, and makes me smile is, is being able to provide that type of service. Uh, and savings for clients. Absolutely. So if we could expand on this so that uh, listeners can get an idea whether or not they're a good fit for Latitude, who are your ideal clients? Wow, that's a good question. Our, I, our clients do come from all over the world. Um, you know, I'd say one of our more popular markets right now is the United States. And we've really seen the U.S. Uh, market increase the demand from there over the last eight years or so. Uh, as you can imagine, every time there's a federal election there, you know, people get nervous and um, politically they're quite divided at the moment. And mm. so it generally drives interest for people looking at alternatives um, of citizenship and residency. And not everybody, you know, these programs, a lot of them don't, don't force you to move or relocate. You know, they allow you to continue living in your home country, but have the option to reside there occasionally or full time. Um, right. And so there's a lot of flexibility there. But certainly, you know, the United States is a, a very important market for us uh, right now. Um, and those as well coming from perhaps countries with a weaker passport. And when I say weaker passport, what I mean by that is the visa free travel that their passport affords might be quite uh, low uh, in terms of how many countries they can go to without requiring a visa. Whereas, you know, a Caribbean passport could all of a sudden help increase their visa free travel and allow them and their family members to travel more freely around the world. So you, do you have clients then obviously would have um, a passport that uh, allows or multiple passports that allow them to reside in multiple different locations and invest real estate and uh, in multiple different locations? Is that how, how this works? Yet they can it's come exactly and go? Exactly. Um, so it, it again, it depends on the country in terms of the minimum number of days, if any, that you must reside in the country. Uh, yep. If you if you look at a country like Canada, um, they have a, a startup visa program, uh, which attracts entrepreneurs to Canada. And in order to and you get permanent residency from day one, and in order to maintain that permanent residency, you would need to spend 40 percent of your time over a five year period in Canada. So it's it's still quite flexible, but there is a, a, a requirement there. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, if you look at a program like Portugal, they only require seven days per year in the country in order to maintain the resident status. So it's much more flexible than perhaps Canada. Um, and so, again, it depends what the client's looking for. Um, but usually it's anywhere from zero to kind of you know, six months out of the year that you must spend in a country. Understood. Now, I was uh, looking at your passport index on your website. Tell us a little mm. bit about that. Yeah, that's a, a tool that we, we've we helped to develop um, to, to inform clients of where they can travel to on their particular passport. So you go to our website under the about section, you can select the index, passport index, and then type in your passport. If it's, say, Australia, or Canada, in my case, it'll show you the different uh, visa-free countries you have access to. And there's different types. So some countries require no visa, like I can travel freely to the United States. I don't have to apply for a visa. I have visa-free travel there. Others may require uh, an application on arrival. And so it's a very straightforward process. Others are an e-visa. You apply online before you travel and it's usually a rubber stamp kind of thing to, yeah. to be granted the, the, to travel. And then of course there's the old fashioned way, which many people from countries with a weak passport have to endure is they have to send their passport away. 
uh, to the embassy of the country they want to visit and then it's tied up there for three four five six weeks before it's sent back with a visa or possibly a denial uh, for a, a visitor visa. See, so, you know, this is all about uh, expediting the process for people who are, uh, you know, keen. Let's call it to to take advantage of these services. Um, from the from the moment that somebody connects with you, what's the I guess the typical um, timeline that you've seen? You've just touched on six months, and I guess that that timeline would vary from um, different type of programs. Yeah. That's exactly right. So in the Caribbean, you're generally looking at a minimum of six months uh, to nine months for the entire process from start until the passport is issued. Um, other countries, Canada, 18 to 24 months, sometimes even longer. As I said, Portugal, it's currently backlog. It could be up to two years or longer. Yeah. But the government recognizes that's a major uh, weakness of their program. And, and so they're actively rectifying that. Uh, by hiring more uh, pros, case processors to help with the backlog and, and doing some other initiatives to help alleviate that. But generally speaking, most of these programs are, I'd say, a minimum of six months. Um, in the case of Malta citizenship, it's about an 18-month journey from start to finish. I can't help but think about the long-term relationships that must be having to be forged because of these delays um, and acting as that third party between you and the government authorities and so forth. How important are the relationships that you forge with your clients? Oh, they're extremely important. So it's it's not just a one-time transactional relationship, right? It, it's a long-term relationship that we have with these clients. And so we're helping them with that second citizenship or that residence. But then for some of them, you know, they have requirements. Antigua has a, a small five-day residency requirement that must be met with a, within the first years of first five years of the citizenship being granted. So we can help organize that for clients to come to the country and take their oath and everything and, and meet that five day requirement. Other countries require renewals for the residency permit like Portugal in year two and year four, that residency permit needs to be renewed. So again, we're helping with that, uh, that process. If you look at the multi citizenship program, it's uh, you must maintain a residential address for five years after citizenship is granted. Yeah. So we're maintaining that relationship the entire time with the client. Um, and, you know, we work really closely with these clients that we stay in touch with for long periods of time. I, I, I have a, a classic case of a, a client I met who's from the United States. We, we helped him obtain residency in Switzerland. And every time I'm there, we, we get together uh, for it. a coffee or, or lunch, right? And it's it's just that connection that we forged through a close relationship of building their application. Yeah, absolutely vital. Now, I have to say, John, I'm very impressed with your level of knowledge and your ability just to basically recite all of these requirements. But given the, the changing nature of legislation from location to location, it must be challenging. How is it that Latitude goes about uh, keeping up with that side of it? There is a lot of changes in the industry, right? Um, yeah. Certainly programs come and go or, or, or fine tune as the case of, of Portugal. They, they love to fine tune their program every year or two years. And so we as a company, we have what we call program champions. So people who kind of live and breathe a particular program, they're on the ground, typically in the country. Uh, my largest office, for example, is in Malta. And so they're well uh, positioned to find out what's happening at all times with the programs. And so if there is a, a, direct, a directive from the government to change uh, part of the application process or what have you, they're on top of it. You know, for the Portugal Golden Visa, again, I have a champion uh, who, who lives in Portugal and works there for us and uh, out of our office in Portugal, and they know that program inside and out. So when there are changes, they're one of the first to know. And so they can then disseminate that to the rest of the, the team. And so the knowledge is shared. Um, but it, it's really through os osmosis that you start to learn these things day in and day out. And, you know, yeah. being in the industry now, I think for 15 years for me, I, I've just seen, I've seen it all. <laughs> I've seen time flies when you fun. And go. <laughs> it does. Yeah. yeah. But you just stay on top of it. You have to, right. You have yeah. to be able to provide accurate uh, and timely information to your clients. I'm loving this call, John. Thank you so very much. Now, um, this doesn't happen in isolation. Uh, you're not an island. You obviously have a large and active team globally. You've served, what, more than 7,000 clients so far and growing. Tell us a little bit about the team from top down. 
Certainly. So uh, one of my my business partners, my co-founders, Mr. Eric uh, Major, is our our CEO and chairman. So he is a pioneer in the industry, uh, over 30 years of experience, and and he's really the head of our government advisory team, along with Christopher Willis, another gentleman with nearly 30 years experience. Mm -hmm. And so those two uh, are part of the core uh, government advisory team and have a lot of experience helping governments over the years with their programs from advising the Canadian, the UK governments, the Malta government, um, Grenada, Anguilla, et cetera. So they have a lot of experience and, and they have really strong reputations within the industry. And so they're regularly co quoted in the media uh, as an authoritative source of information. And we also have another co-founder, uh, Ryan Darman in, in our Malta office, uh, who's instrumental in keeping um, all of our knowledge on that program and that important jurisdiction for us, uh, both their, their permanent residence program and their citizenship program. Mm -hmm. um, so those are really some of our, our key team members. Yeah, there's lots there, that's for sure and certain. I'm very, uh, very excited for anybody who's listening in this call today. Uh, by the end of it, you'll know exactly what you need to do to learn more. But uh, you know, we talk about onboarding as you know some sort of a, just a quick and easy process. I suspect this would take some time. I'm wondering if you could explain uh, as we uh, get to the pointy end of the call the onboarding process. Certainly. So once a client, we've kind of narrowed down what program they're they're interested in. We'll then do go through the onboarding process, and so this is essentially a, a more in depth you know, know your client, KYC, we have them fill out a document, send it back along with copies of the passports for all family members, as well as a proof of residential address. And then we'll actually run our background checks on all prospective clients before accepting them. So, you know, 90% of people pass with flying colors, there's nothing in their background. You know, another 5% we need to dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. There's something there that might have raised a flag. And so we'll investigate that a little deeper. And then about 5% or probably even less, slightly less, we reject uh, because either they don't have a high probability to be accepted for the program uh, or they're a reputational risk to our firm. And so, you know, we don't want to be submitting applications unless they're, we're very confident they're going to get approved of because, course. you know, that affects our reputation, not mm -hmm. just with the client, yep. but with the government as well. If yep. we're consistently sending them bad applicants, they're not going to be happy. Um, so that onboarding process with the client just to get to a latitude client agreement is, is crucial. And it's just a vital part of, of our of our company, our, our ethos. And once a client passes that, then we would move to the client agreement and get started on their actual application. And so again, each program varies, but they generally have the same set of parameters when it comes to say the five Caribbean citizenship programs, they're all quite similar in terms of what the documentation requirements are. What starts to vary is, you know, who qualifies for a dependent for each program? What are the costs? You know, they vary from yeah. program to pro program, but fundamentally, the documentation is it can be quite similar for a lot of these programs. See, I love the fact that you simplify what can obviously be a very complex uh, set of steps to to achieve these outcomes. How does it make you feel when you actually see your clients achieve the results that they're after through Latitude? It's hugely rewarding. You know, um, I had a client call me once and he said he broke down crying when he received his Malta passport. And it, you know, it was a, it, it was a complex application with a lot of moving parts, but we ultimately got him over the finish line. And I never expected that reaction from him. And he said he didn't either, but he was just so thankful that he received the second citizenship and he was setting up his family for life, right. With more options to, um, you know, to be able to live and work anywhere in Europe and that kind of emotional outburst was unexpected but it was it, it felt really good that we were able to be a small part of that you know it's not just a business you know it becomes a, a, an impacting uh, experience for those that are working with you and, and it's it's a credit to you now um, when people want to learn more john where do they go where's the best place best place is our website so that's uh www.latitudeworld.com Latitude. And there they can find uh, under the about section if they want to contact me directly, of course they can, uh, or contact us, uh, any one of my colleagues. We're on the, the team page there, um, some of the key people. 
and feel free to reach out or just explore our website to learn more about these programs. And we're always happy to sit with a client. It, you know, we don't charge for the initial consultation to review their situation and help them find the right program for them. That's all complimentary and we're happy to do so with, with any prospective clients. Fantastic, John. Thank you so very much. Now, if you're on this call today, you've heard what we've talked about, you're interested in learning more, I will be making sure that you get access to latitudeworlds.com uh, uh, um, address below this post, no matter where you see, hear or listen to the show, you'll be able to find the links back to John and his wonderful team. With all that being said, John, thank you so very much for joining me on the My Future Business Show today. Rick, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.